welcome to episode 234 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. Joining me this week is Tony Walmsley from the Leaders Advisory. Tony's going to talk about all kinds of things relating to management in the 21st century and creating high performance teams, which is really relevant for us when we're dealing with some very high pressure situations, especially around peak. What is peak these days? is 12 months of the year but you all know what I mean being able to be it get the best out of your organization no matter what the circumstances so coming up in just a moment Tony Walmsley from the leaders advisory Joining me on the line is Tony Walmsley. Tony is a former professional football manager and business leader. He's now a performance coach and profiling specialist. You're not profiling with the FBI or anything like that, are you, Tony? Uh, I'm no. not, Ian, no. <laughs> uh, dear, as part of his consultancy, the Leaders Advisory, Tony helps organizations achieve higher levels of engagement and productivity while reducing stress. Tony, those are major themes for us in the postal and the delivery sector these days we've been we've had a big 2020 let's just put it that way so it's probably a good time for us to sort of take a breath and reflect on what we've been doing and how we can do things better before we get stuck into things tony do you want to just give us a quick overview of some of the companies that you've been working with recently and the kind of things that you've been helping companies with yeah for sure uh, and and i think you're right 2020 is uh, you know a, a been a big challenge for everybody and, and certainly over here in the UK it, it, it's an ongoing challenge created a lot of uncertainty uh, which is which is why I exist if you take a, an industry like aviation for example who have you know hit significant you know barriers to productivity and you know they're downsizing and living in this world of volatility um, they have they're in a constant state of change and that puts people under un- uncommon and unusual pressure. So I'm, I'm working in that sector, helping leaders and teams to readjust performance expectations and performance management to, to ensure they get the most out of the, the, those insights that, that they're, you know, I, I strongly believe competitive advantage lives within organizations and is, is somewhat untapped. And that's what I hope to address today. But aviation is a good example of that. Also working in technology, Supply chain and logistics, uh, which will be, I guess, right up your alley. Um, and I tap back into football. I'm doing some work with with a charity. Uh, I'm doing some work with uh, managing director of of, a, of an English league football club. So I work with you know high performing individuals and also with 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 complex organisations who've got big problems to solve. Well, let's start with stress and planning for peak season because this is it used to be at least in the postal sector that we'd have a quiet period let us just talk about australia for a moment everybody january would be quiet and then we sort of build up during the year and then december would be big nowadays uh, the, it's not just december that's big uh, p- that peak season is crept into november and we've now adopted the trends of having the Black Friday, Cyber Monday specials. It means that there's an extended peak period. And now, thanks to that blasted virus, we've had peak for much of 2020. So let's start with this, Tony. So dealing with stress in teams, especially people who might be on the front line and dealing with not just excessive parcel volumes, but also health concerns, And then also turning our mind to how we can plan for future peak seasons. What are some of the things that we should be thinking about? It's a a great question. And, you know, we could speak on the whole podcast about that, I guess. If I equate it to football first. So if you think about high performance sport where the cyclic demand that you're talking about, this, it happens on a weekly basis. So on a Saturday afternoon as a footballer or a football manager, you're under the most scrutiny there's consequences for for failure you know whatever those consequences might be there's an impact the result that you hope to achieve hasn't been met and everybody gets upset about it and and consequences come on on the back of that but with all the data that's available to you you then get to recover you you then get to plan and strategize and you know that the next site so you know when the pressure's coming and you plan accordingly to be able to a cope with that demand, and then b do better than you did last time. So be more efficient in in your case, or in football, be 
you know, when when you've got a decision to make, make the right decision this time instead of the wrong decision, and boom, there there we go. We've had an in, increase in performance. So that's that's all well and good until you start to think about well, well, what what is high performance then in context, and who, who defines that? Where does that count for me as an individual? So if if we accept that this demand is this external demand is coming, and that the outcome that's expected is somewhat out of our control then we're dealing with all those bits in the middle so you talk about demand you talk about time pressure you talk about quota if you're in a sales environment you're talking about you know having to report on numbers quarterly or 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 monthly that's the scrutiny and that's where people get a little bit uncomfortable i think what we have to be able to do is in order, in order to optimize our potential to meet that extraordinary demand when when it comes, is make sure people are in the right environment, fully in order to get people fully immersed in what they're doing, in the right environment, fully productive, feeling great about it, is two things. It's making sure they're doing the job that they're best equipped to do. And that's not just about skill set, that's about personality. That's about I like doing lots of repetitive tasks. Or I like doing lots of phone calls because I love talking to people. Don't get one who likes one doing the other thing too much because if you do, it's there's going to be a a, a deficit somewhere and 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 somewhere quick. And then beyond that, it's about it's about management. We can talk about about management. And 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 if I could just lead on on that with, there's two real reasons why disengagement. Uh, is is at such high levels and we're talking about 65 percent of the global workforce are passively disengaged one is environment they're doing the wrong thing too much of the time so there's a misfit like a bunch of misfits come together in the misfit in the environment before the manager even gets started and then you've got the, you know the majority of people quit work cite their manager as the reason why is a real serious problem that that, that we should be looking to address So you add the stress that you're talking about, this peak demand. On top of that, the complexity is, you know, it should be impossible for people to navigate through that, but it's not. And that's, I guess, why I exist and and, and, and why there's so much room for improvement within organizations. When we look at planning, whether it's for peak season or whatever, though, there are things that are within your control and things that are outside your control. So um, you can say, well, look, we need to hire a certain number of people, but it's dependent upon the labour market having that number of people <laughs> available. And there are various things like that. So from a management perspective, uh, and when we were talking beforehand, Tony, you used the phrase external uncontrollable pressures. Now, how, what is, how, how does this concept fit into how you can plan for, in our, in our case, in our industry, a peak season? Well, first, if you, if you, have, if you know you've got to recruit large numbers of people, that's if you're doing that using a decent data set, that's okay. So you, if you know exactly what the job entails that you're recruiting for and you can recruit for fit, that's better than any sort of interview process where you're you're allowing your own conscious bias and preference for people that you like or are like you to come in and do all these jobs. You're going to get it wrong and you're going to get it wrong in a, in a big way. So if you, if you've got a high volume of people coming in, you can, you can, Get a big chunk of it right at the outset by using data sets to 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 get people properly aligned to those tasks in the first place. You, you're on a winner there, and then it's about management. And management is about it's about who you're being. It's not, it's not about it's not about what you're doing or how good you are at, at, at doing what you do. It's about who you're being. People want to know that you care about them. They they want to know that you're interested in their ability to succeed in the jobs that you want them to be able to succeed at. And that's ultimately how me as a manager, you know, if I take responsibility for the performance of my team, then I'm doing myself a great disservice if I don't adapt as often and frequently as required towards my team on their terms to understand their needs and what works for them is where the, it doesn't matter whether that's in high demand or low demand, it's who you are being that counts far more than the, the, the things that you're that you're going to be doing because the external demand is fixed. I used to say in football that it's the game that demands whether you 
can or can't do it in the moment. So, so if you step up on your, on your first team debut in a professional environment, you're faced with a lot of uncertainty. You've never been there before. And in front of you is a challenge that you will either meet or you won't meet based on your ability in that moment to make an independent decision. So you've got a lot of responsibility on, on your shoulders to do that. But the challenge is fixed by something external to you. So in the context of the postal service or the logistics organization, the demand is to do this by this time in this number, and it's fixed. It's external to what the manager thinks, what the, the CEO thinks, what the person who's doing the job thinks. So the only bit that then needs to be brought into clear focus is then then what do I actually need to be doing and need to be doing well consistently in order to move towards that? And it's the moving towards that's important. It's not getting there that's important. That's the bit that's measures and people scrutinize. But what needs to be really focused on is the, the very small micro steps towards that. And, and when people can immerse themselves in that, because they like what they're doing, because they've they they feel that they're believed in by the manager who may have just walked in in the door. By the way, it's possible it's possible to get it really wrong, and it's possible to get it right from the from the outset as well. Um, then this this it's like this. How would you? It's like this flow. You're fully immersed in what you're doing, without focusing on what the end goal is, and you suddenly end up there and go, oh wow, what a great season that was. Now, in the course of what you just said, though, Tony, you touched on management styles. And if you're talking about a postal organization, there are lots of different people doing different kinds of jobs. Some are very process oriented, some might be sales oriented, some might be have, have, have a creative angle. And the same in the private uh, delivery companies. Again, delivery people, people in warehouses, people in sorting centers, they're very process oriented versus people who are working in sales or wherever. So, at whatever level of management you're at, from being a line manager through to being a senior executive, how do these different styles of management play out And when you're managing teams? Do you, do you need to adapt your own style or do you have to find the right environment for your management style? What are some of the things that we can sort of mull over on that? I think the start point for for any discussion around people is individuality it's diversity it's 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 to dispel the myths that that my way is the best way or that one certain type of manager is the best type of manager um because i think when you do a a broad enough analysis of a of a team of leaders for example you'll 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 often find that they come from all corners of the I suppose personality spectrum, if you like. Um, same with sales leaders. You know, for the sales leader who thinks that the only way to be a, that, that that has that mindset that all salespeople are this type of person, and usually that's like me, you know, and it's got you know the the, the assumption that I was really successful as a salesperson, therefore everybody that's like me are going to be successful as a salesperson, and that's the way to do it. it becomes problematic when you approach a let, let's say the new sales sales director walks into a uh, a new job um, with a, a a pool of twenty salespeople under his or her charge, and applies things that were really successful at the last place or from the get go, and this with this mindset that I'm that my way is the way it's been successful before, therefore it's going to be successful again, and that style suits only maybe twenty percent of the the new team that they're working with from, from day one, from that first sales meeting where you're putting forward the best version of yourself to this new group in order to light fires under people to go and do the biggest, you know, sales quote, sales quarter they've ever done. Um, you've just to some degree demotivated 80% of, of your team in the first meeting. And that, that can start a deficit spiral um, that you don't recover from. So, number one, it's about it's about saying okay that there isn't one style of management that's best. Like you say, it's understanding the style of manager that you are that is true to you know. If you want to be leading authentically, then you you need a high level of self awareness to understand what that actually means. And then when you when you, 
when you understand that, only then can you recognize the value in having that depth of understanding about the people to with with whom you're working and, and who you want to do the best job for you and for your team. So I, I think it's respecting the individuality and that cuts through diversity and all sorts of things. It's even more high resolution than that. It's recognizing that everybody's got a set of unique gifts to, to bring to the table. So as a as a manager, that's me first. What are mine? What do I do well? What don't I do well? Who do I need to lean on to get the bits that I don't have in my armory? And then take that into uh, you know be open be present and 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 listen for understanding with the people that you're working for and they again i'll go back to what i said earlier your people want to know how much you care about them not necessarily how many boxes you need to tick by the end of the day they're interested in you know being valued being respected being understood you know, this is where this is where trust is built. This is where culture culture lives in the gaps between how I speak to you and how what my intentions are and how those intentions are understood. In in what you've just been saying, Tony, you've you've talked about the new sales director coming in and confronting, for want of a better word, or encountering an established workforce, and this is something that we're seeing in the postal sector and in the delivery sector is that posts and delivery companies are hiring people from outside of the delivery world um, in all kinds of management roles. So someone might come in to the, even CEO roles we've seen, uh, recent CEOs of many major postal operators have come in with no actual postal or logistics experience. So if you're coming in as an outsider, especially in a leadership role, what are some of the things that you can do to help that transition, to help understand your team, help understand the environment and those sorts of things? That's a, that, that, that's a great question. And it, what it highlights in its essence is the complexity that's at play. And, the, you know, the, peop, the, the competitive advantage lives within organizations. It's just untapped. So if you go into a new line of business, but you've had great, managerial success or leadership success in the past and then you transition into this new sector and you're hired obviously on the back of being great at something so it's it's almost assumed so you don't need to go in and prove yourself because you've already got through the interview process to get there so that in itself is a great lesson to take in with you that I don't need to prove myself so if you if you have that mindset that I'm just going to be and this goes back to authenticity if, if I'm just being rather than trying to do what's expected i'm just being because i know my stuff i know what i'm here to do so that that if if, if that's a given if you suspend judgment if and not everybody will suspend judgment people from day one in that organization will be going who the hell's he he's never worked in post before he's never done logistics he came from technology what would he know you know that is a living and breathing reality that people you know, you know, me going into a football job, what's he ever done, you know? And you, you've got to win those people over straight away. So you can't possibly win those people over by who know more about the industry than you do. So, you know, if me as a manager work with Luis Garcia, who's a Champions League, played for Barcelona and Liverpool, it, it's not for me to tell him how to be a good footballer. It really wouldn't work because he's got that over me every day of the week. So so it's about the, then who who are you being and the, the 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 people want to be trusted, they want to trust you. Um they want to know you care, they want to be valued, all these things that we've we that we've talked about already. And if you can enter that if if you're a manager who's faced with this situation going into it in the new year or you've just taken on a new role think th think about it this way all of the potential either untapped or or to be realized is is right in front of you and at the moment you're probably looking at this group of this new group of people and they're they're almost like like blurred outlines of people they're they're people there but they're not fully formed because you don't know enough about them they're they're as complex as individuals each of them as you are as an individual 
Now, work really hard on understanding yourself first and, and keep that. That's a, that's a never ending, that's a lifelong journey, you know, to that whole self actualization piece. That's a whole lifelong journey. So while you're on that journey and you're understanding about yourself, take the time to get to know each individual. And we talk about motivation and performance. You know, motivation's intrinsic. So I'm motivated by whatever motivates me. What am I, you know, am I driven by? Uh, ambition am i driven by status am i driven by connection you know people have got multiple different drivers and the best managers or leaders will take the time to understand what 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 they are and play to those because the people if that's how they're driven that's how they're driven so if you as a manager can uncover that and unearth it for yourself wow you two are going to get on great because you just know you know what what works and what doesn't and when you tie that to have you got people in the right environment to start with you've got a a brand new you know you talk about business culture you've you've got the formation or foundation of a great team a, a great a great culture because people are recognized for what they do well and they're given the opportunity to do that most of the time and the connection they have with the boss is such that wow he knows or she knows how what I'm good at encourages me to do it, gives me the confidence to be myself, all, all of those great things that we'd all love to be going to work to do every day. Now, we're talking about you know, ideal management habits and practices and things like that, but let's also be really brutally honest here. Uh, we sometimes see a lot of bloodletting when it comes to you know, changes of manager. And it's, I suppose this is a similarity between football and you know, senior levels of management. When you see a new CEO coming to an organization, they, they'll, they'll be dealing with a couple of things. One is understanding the, the team, like you just said. Two, they're probably dealing with people internally who wanted that job and they want to have also people that trust in their, in their um, executive team or the senior management team, or whatever it might be. And Tony, I'm sure you can give us half a dozen examples of football club teams where the same thing has happened. A new manager has come in. So uh, the, how can um, you know, there's, there's the people underneath that have to manage that as well. So even if you are not p- part of that senior executive team, you still have to deal with that and some of the uncertainty that might it might create within the own team that your your team that you manage. Mm-hmm. So if you are CEO minus three, and so you're out of the hurly burly of what's happening in the executive suite, but still you've got a team that you have to manage. Have you got any sort of insights or tips as to how managers sort of so a few levels down from the CEO might be able to deal with that sort of turbulence that might be happening in the boardroom? Yeah, I mean the that. You know what? What do we all? We all want certainty. We all want to know uh, what's in front of us, so that we can focus, put our focus where our focus need, needs to be. Of course, if we're distracted by or concerned by the noise or the external stuff that's again outside of our control, then it, by definition, takes us off focus. So we only focus on one thing at a time. So, how do we do that? Is, is is a good question. Uh, it, and it's really about being fully present. There's two things that tend to happen. One is I think about, you know, if I want to perform really well, A, I need to have, not, if I've got some experience and I know what that looks like, I can tap back into history. I can look back and go, when I was at my best, this is what I was doing. So I can try and do that again. So I can I can tap back into that. If I'm a bit younger and don't have that experience, I've got to wing it a little bit and people get by on talent when they're, when they're young to a degree until they become more fully rounded. And then there's looking to the future, either aspirationally towards a goal or with uncertainty, which is what you're talking about here. I'm looking beyond what I'm not dealing with the facts at the moment. I'm dealing with some facts, which is there's a lot of stuff going on over me. That's making me feel a bit uncomfortable. Um, now, why is it making me feel uncomfortable? Because I don't actually know what that means for me. Does it mean I'm going to lose my job in in three months' time? Or, I mean, that that's uh, it's almost irrational thinking because there's no answer. 
So it's it's really is as simple as stop thinking about that stuff because it's not going to help. Or if you want clarity and you've got a little bit of courage, maybe with the right approach, asking the people above you what's going on or is there anything that they're able to share so you can get the clarity that you need. But but living in the future and living in the past don't help a great deal when what's required, as we said earlier, is that the, the, the business demands or the demands of the football match are fixed by stuff, not by people. They're just fixed. You have to do this well in order to succeed. And that doesn't change. So when all this uncertainty is going on above you and whether you've got experience or no experience in the sector or in the industry, it doesn't really matter. If you're immersed, if you're in the right job and you're immersed and challenged by, so in the right job means you're motivated, you're good at what you're being asked to do. It ticks your box in terms of the drivers. So if you're ambitious, it's allowing you the chance to, to grow and all that kind of stuff. Then the best you can do is, is the best you can do all the time. It's put your attention to what you can do. So do your own job absolutely fantastically well. Because if something changes above you, you can't do anything about it anyway. So this is about focusing on your own job, what you can control, and not worrying about what's, or not worrying unduly, I suppose, about what's beyond your control. Yeah, but if you are worried about it, ask the question and, and get clarity where you're, not, where, where you're unclear. I, I guess the challenge is, and anxiety lives in the future. It, it lives in an unknown future. So when the future's unknown, there's, a, there's an increased sense of anxiety. Now, now we're talking about this, this manager potentially three tiers down in an organization. I, I would address this to the person one step above that and one step above that again and, and, and be saying to them, hey, you know that this uncertainty is happening here. You, you've got a responsibility here to understand how this might be impacting the person in the next tier down. Now go and have a conversation with them. Be as open as you can with the information that you've got and put them at ease. What, what do you want them to do? You want them to be fully focused on the job that they've, that they've been set and not be worried about what's going on over the head. So take the concern away. Tony, if anyone listening to this wants to find out more about your work at the Leaders Advisory, how can they get in contact? Um, they can contact, they can book a call on the website, www.theleadersadvisory.com, or they can email, email me directly, tony at theleadersadvisory.com. I'll stick a link on thepostalhub.com to Tony's website. And you're on LinkedIn as well, aren't you, Tony? I'll yeah. stick your LinkedIn address on there as well so people can find out more about what Tony does. Tony Walmsley from The Leaders Advisory, thank you very much for joining us on the Postal Hub podcast today. My pleasure. Thanks a lot, Ian. Coming soon on the Postal Hub podcast, Sharik Mirza from Assurity Consulting on making the most of data, Perry Laverne from Last Mile Experts on measuring postal performance, and international IT security expert John Taylor joins us to talk about cyber security strategy for the postal and delivery sectors. You can subscribe to this podcast on a variety of podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the rest. And when you're there, when you're hitting subscribe, just take a moment to give us a, a stellar rating on the various podcast platforms. If you have an email address, and I'm reckoning that you do, put it to good use. Sign up for the Postal Hub email newsletter. It's a weekly email update that comes out every week. Like I just said, it has the latest episode of the podcast, anything else I've written or recorded for the last mile profits during the week. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, when you send that invitation to connect, just customize it. Just customize it. Tell me who you are, why you want to connect, because I get loads of connections and I ignore them because I figure they're all tire kickers and things like that. So please just send a message when you send that invitation to connect. And if you want to contact me about anything at all, just drop me a line via email. Ian, Ian, I'll get it in a second. I say it every week. Ian at thepostalhub.com is my email address. I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in. And I look forward to your company next time on the Postal Hub podcast.